Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dana Shen. I want to welcome all the participants who have joined us for tonight's webinar and the viewers who are watching the podcast. We now have 1,595 people who are involved. Before we go forward, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands. Um, Emerging Minds and MHPN wish to acknowledge the custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants since are located. We wish to pay respect to elders past and present and emerging leaders uh, for the memories, the traditions, the culture, the strengths and hopes of Indigenous Australia. My name is Dana Shen. I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I am a Ngunnawal Chinese woman with my own social services consultancy and am a cultural consultant to Emerging Minds. A few words about the webinar series before we get started. This is the fifth in our second series of webinars we will be bringing to you during 2020. You can view previous webinars on the MHPN and Emerging Minds website. Before we get started, just a few points about the platform we are using tonight. You will notice that the webcast platform has changed. Most of the navigation buttons for functions are located at the top right of your screen. To access the chat box, click on the purple button. If you have questions, use the blue hand button and enter your question. Slides and resources available from the light blue download button. Refresh button is the green button with circled arrow. There is also a help button if you need assistance. You can message Redback directly or ring 1-800-733-416. Now getting into the webinar series. In this session, we have a set of learning outcomes that include describing the effects of intergenerational trauma on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families, outlining current research that underlines the importance of cultural competence in all Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal services, so that Aboriginal children and their families receive the kind of support that they need. And finally, the third learning outcome is discussing examples of organisational and individual practice that has built trust and collaboration with communities and led to positive outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families. And finally, just a word from, from all of us. Yes, this is a story about trauma, but it is also about many stories of strengths hopes and dreams. And finally, I just wanted to recognise the challenges all people are going through in response to COVID-19. We know that there are also others that are being affected in much harder ways than some of us. And we just wanted to recognise that and that we are thinking of everyone going through this at the moment. So one of the things that I wanted to point out was that we've actually had the bio disseminated already with the webinar invitation. In the interest of ensuring we have maximum time um, for our panelists tonight, I'll just go through the names and skip over the bios. So we have a wonderful group of women that are involved tonight. First of all, we have Emeritus Professor Judy Atkinson. We have Associate Professor Kath Chamberlain. We also have Dr. Carolyn, also known as Carly Atkinson. So welcome all to, to all of the panels, panelists tonight. We are in a very lucky space to be able to listen to all of these amazing women. But before we get started, given the nature of the topic, we know that this can bring up many things for people. And we just want to acknowledge the potential triggers and emotions. And then on that, what I'd like to do in the first instance is to hand over to Carly, just to talk us through the we early approach to this. Carly, can I hand over to you? Thanks, Dana, and um, thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Dana said, before we start getting the yarn about the generational trauma on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families, it is very important that we acknowledge that when we have these truth telling yarns, it does have the potential to help us and to things in ourselves, maybe from our own pain and trauma and also I'm feeling other pain. So within the Carly, just let, Carly, just letting you know, it's doing a little bit of cutting out at the moment. So I might just hand to Judy. Judy, Judy I wondered if you could just speak to um, uh, this particular slide. 
sure. Uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry, because yes. Holly uh, can talk to it so much better than I can. So the growth slide is important for us to ground ourselves. In grounding ourselves, um, we take some deep breaths. Uh, we release those breaths. I tend to put my hand uh, just under my, my uh, waist and on my chest and I breathe in five times and I feel the breath going deep in. Uh, then I release. I'm aware that I'm releasing uh, whatever's coming out. I observe. I, I'm aware of what I might be, uh, what might be happening in my body and I observe as I'm doing that. Uh, and then I witness for myself, okay, so I'm not feeling really good at the moment or I'm feeling fine and I'm feeling really balanced sitting here now at the moment. Uh, I might find somebody to talk to uh, if I'm not feeling too well. And then uh, the healing happens as we continue to do that. So growth is um, grounding ourselves, um, breathing, being aware of our breath, Observing what our body is saying to us, including as we breathe in and out. We witness what might come up for us, and then we might find somebody to talk to. So that's our growth, and it's, um, it's a self care model that uh, Kali put together um, to manage triggers, particularly when we're running workshops, which are pretty hard at times. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Judy. And I'm so sorry, Carly. Um, and, and actually what I want to mention on that is we are having, we are in spaces where um, uh, it's creating some technical difficulties for us at the moment around our Wi-Fi and internet connections. Our, our greatest apologies and we'll, we'll do the best we can tonight. So now I'd like to move on to the session. And before we go on and actually hear from these amazing women, I wanted to first of all introduce um, a video that we'll be playing uh, from the Healing Foundation. The story of our communities, people and nation starts a long, long time ago. More than 60,000 years, in fact. This was when our culture and our law first started to thrive. We knew who we were and where we belonged. We took care of each other, our land and our waters. We ate food that made us healthy, lived on country and abided by our laws and song lines. Our families, our children were happy with strong minds and hearts because they were where they belonged. But then everything changed. Colonization came, bringing wars, disease, famine, violence, and the destruction and violation of our cultural laws, sacred sites, families, and communities. We were denied our knowledge, language, ceremonies, and identity. The very things that tell us who we are and where we belong, and our connections with each other and the land grew weak. And then, our children were taken from us. They had their names changed and their identities stripped away. They were told that Aboriginal people were bad. Worse still, they were told that their parents and grandparents did not want them. For years this happened, and those children became known as the Stolen Generations. Our children were denied love and experienced physical, emotional and sexual abuse. This left very deep, very complex, and very real wounds, leaving scars that are still being felt personally, socially, spiritually, and collectively. 
in the time when our story started. We were able to parent in the cultural way that has seen our family survive and thrive for generations. Our people were strong and our culture flowed and healed us in times of hurt. But since the trauma of colonization and the stolen generation, we have not been able to heal in the same way. And we have unknowingly passed this trauma on to our children through sharing our sad stories and having them witness and experience our pain. This is known as intergenerational trauma. And we see symptoms today in broken relationships, disconnected families, violence, suicide, and drug and alcohol abuse. But this is not where our story ends. We still have strong minds and hearts, and we still know who we were and where we belong by creating safe and strong communities together, supporting our families to be free from pain, returning to our culture and building a strength of identity, we can stop the cycle of trauma and bring about positive intergestional change so that we can continue to thrive for the next 60,000 years. There are simple things that we can all do to help heal our trauma. Visit healingfoundation.org.au to find out more. So that was the video from the Healing Foundation. Now I'd like to go back to the panellists and start our group discussion with all of them. So from that, that, that video, we started to um, have uh, the question of intergenerational trauma being touched on, the impacts of that. But I have a question for you all to start with. Um, can you talk more in depth um, of the impacts of intergenerational trauma on our people? Judy, I'd like to hand over to you first to start that con this discussion. Thank you, Dana. In all the places where, where I've worked on suicide, family violence, child removal from child harm, children being expelled from school, and more particularly in prison, um, I've learned by listening and by just being aware that I'll learn deeply. And I've got a couple of stories I want to share. Um, I was uh, in Etna Creek Prison in Queensland, and uh, a young fellow had been brought in he just been sentenced to life. He had uh, apparently uh, murdered two people. He had no memory of it. So we were sitting together and I wanted to open the conversation. So I said to him, what's the thing you most remember in your life? Now, it's an open question. It could be negative or positive or whatever. Uh, I was just hoping to be able to open the conversation. And he said, when my mother cried when they drove me away, and I immediately assumed, so this is an assumption story here as well, that he was talking about his recent uh, sentencing and then being brought out to the prison. And so we started to talk a bit more and I, I started to hear more deeply. And then what came up was that he remembered, he had no memory, no memory at all of uh, the murder that he denied he committed, the two murders. And yet when he talked to me, he had a very clear memory of a two-year-old child looking back through the car as the authorities took him away from his mother and she was standing behind the car crying as he was driven away. He, that was his clearest memory. But he had absolutely no memory of what he had done to bring him to that prison and denied that he'd done anything. I wanted to then expand that a bit more. So there's a generational impact. Uh, between the mother and the child and the authority figures intruding into the lives of people. But I um, also learnt in a time when I was working in Rockhampton in a workshop and there's a woman who had been in a psych unit for some time and um, her husband had looked after her and got her out and she came down to my workshop and she had an insight and this is the story of um, what she shared with me. Uh, she remembered being out of the mission and she was standing with her dad and she said she was holding his hand. She was about seven years of age and she had the biggest, he had the biggest hand, she said. That was her big memory. She was um, holding his hand and then the mission manager called him over and he walked over 
And when he got to the mission manager, the mission manager said in a very harsh voice, Jack, when you come and stand before me, you look down. You do not look at me. Look down. And my aunt there said, and my dad's hands started to tremble. I could feel this big man with this big hand, and his hand was trembling, and he looked down. She then said that in the work we were doing, that she'd realised that they left the mission. And he started to work outside, and every so often he had, would have a rage where there would be domestic violence, and he would uh, act out his, his rage on her mother. And she said her insight was that the fact that he couldn't express his feelings to that mission manager, except the body holding it, was then taken out in the family later on when they left the mission. What I wanted to talk about, therefore, is the pent-up tension uh, across generations when we transfer one uh, behaviour or one memory down to another, and it becomes distorted sometimes, those memories, and we're not sure why. I uh, understand now that the child being driven away at two years of age had an intense fear and a brokenness inside him which stayed with him for the rest of his life. And yet he had no memory of what he did later on. The incredible rage and fear that the man who sat in, the mission, in, in front of the mission manager would have felt, this grown man. And fear learns to anger. He can't express his anger. And unexpressed anger metaphorizes into rage. This week I read that um, in the work that they're doing in trauma, in, in extreme trauma situations, that um, a lot of the children, and I'm seeing this in the school now, the children who um, have a reason to have a fear don't feel it. They have no capacity to name feelings and they will jump immediately into rage and the rage is just acted out. Um, so shame then follows afterwards. Um, my aunt uh, told me how her father then lived with the shame of his domestic violence. Um, the shame becomes embodied. And the outcomes, and this is clearer evidence, uh, research evidence, become in health, substance issues, suicide ideation, uh, and we then become locked into the fight, flight, freeze. Uh, we very rarely can get up into the deep uh, feeling place of being able to name good feelings. And we can't get up to the, um, the neocortex, the thinking place. And the feeling in the thinking place is the place where we can make good decisions. That then leads us across generations. Um, I could talk a lot about walking on to places where people in their feet has felt the massacre site and the stories of the massacre site and the shame uh, and the fear is still embodied in that place and it moves into the body of the people I've been with. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you wanted to me to describe, but I wanted to share two stories to all show, show how, how listening can open our understanding more deeply. Great. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, now, as part of this, I know that uh, one of the, the, the key impacts is also around labelling. And I wondered, Carly, if you could talk us a bit about, through a bit of that. Yeah, sure. Um, and hopefully um, everyone's hearing me clear now. Um, I've had to move to a different area outside. So please let me know if you can hear me. Um, following on from what Mum was talking about, one of the legacies, uh, of intergenerational trauma is labels. The labels that have been applied to our minds, uh, these labels can actually cascade down the generations onto our kids. They are labels that potentially individuals in organisations hold. They may or may not want to stop. And certainly these labels contribute to the cycle of intergenerational trauma within our community in Australia. Within our We Are Lee workshop, that sheds light on the impact from an intergenerational perspective. It's really powerful, uh, really powerful way to embody the impact that labels can have on it. Each of our perspectives has still slightly differently. The message is pretty much the same. Essentially what happens is the workshop is warned that the can be triggering with it. 
you know, there's family in that. And so that's why everyone in the West knows tonight. How we conduct this activity is we first draw an outline of a woman on the paper, we give her a name, and then we put her on the wall. Carly, can you hang on for one moment? Um, sure. I'm just going to, just for a moment, I'm going to hand to Judy because it, it, the sound is going again. I, I didn't want to stop you, though, because I know people really want to listen to you. But I'm just going to go to Judy just for a moment and then come back to you again. Judy, I just wondered if you could continue a bit about what Carly was saying and then I'll come back to Carly again. Oh, I'm really sad about this because Carly's got such a good story there. Um, we asked the participants to... Uh, put on these sticky things there, as you can see, uh, labels, names of people have been called, that they remember that comes down through their own generations. Uh, and it might be the label of being just a bad child or a stupid or um, children that I've been working with have very uh, deeply responsive uh, energy um, fear and anger towards the labels they've got. So Kelly was describing uh, the group putting the labels up there on the body of a woman. Um, and then all of those uh, are words, those labels, the words that they've heard or they've been called themselves. And then they take the labels off and I'm uh, sure that Kelly was then going to describe that they either uh, replace them with uh, other words, positive words, and they will either push the, the labels that have been negative um, into a, a bucket of water and smash them, all, and smash them all up as they go away or they burn them in a, a, in a stereo. Uh, in both cases, um, in one case we're kind of late, naming what people have been called, what they've heard, and I could use quite a few of them, which are really negative to hear, um, and replacing those with, with positive words on what we feel we are, uh, but making sure that we don't carry those labels with us when we leave our workshops. What shocked Thanks, me Judy. was the number of labels. Thank you. What I'll try to do is go back to Carly again and see if we can have her continue. Carly, are you online? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Look, thank you so much. This is, <laughs> this is a little bit funny. It's like a comedy show as I'm moving around the place <laughs> trying to get connectivity. So thank you for all being patient. Um, I did hear where Mum got up to with um, that explanation of the labels. So another thing we do in it too is once those labels go up on the wall, and some of them are just, uh, as Mum's quite devastating, um, and you'll see on the slide there's things like troublemaker, dumb, stupid, no hope, slave, liar, bad mother. I mean, they're horrendous. And interestingly, every time we do this activity, these types of labels come pretty much every time. Um, at Mum's step, pull those labels off the wall um, and we go and burn them. But we usually have wood tape on the ground under the, the woman where the labels are being put up on the wall and there are seeds on the ground. And those seeds represent our new growth, baby children. Um, and, that, and so those labels, all those names, they pull down and they land on the baby. Um, they're the messages that are passed on. So before we go and burn the negative label, take the children off the paper and ensure that we're only burning the negative label um, at the end, which is really important. But if you look at the second slide, um, uh, and Mum talked about a little bit, this is really important. We, when we start to brainstorm the positive label, seeing the PowerPoint, the narrator changes, you know, so words like inner strength, you are the glue, you belong, human, strong, wise, kind, empathy, power, healer, leader, matriarch, role model, resilient, our queen, I'm a proud black woman. Um, I think that's really important to take people out of that space, but what it shows is that we clearly need to change the narrative, become aware of the labels we hold and pass on, as it certainly contributes to the intergenerational trauma response. And I think through generating our own awareness, we can all be part of that narrative. Mm. Thanks mm. very much, Carly. Um, thank, thank you both, uh, Judy and Carly, for that.
Um, I now want to move on to Kath. Kath, I wondered if you could now talk us through the psychological, physical, social and emotional impacts um, that you've seen in relation to the impacts of intergenerational trauma. Okay, thanks, Dana, and hello, everyone, and, and thanks, um, Judy, for that lovely, really rich story, and, and um, Carly for those really good examples of labelling. So, um, as a midwife, you know, I've found it really important to, to understand what's going on with trauma. This is all relatively new to me in the last couple of years, and um, it's in looking, working with families, you know, I really think that understanding what is happening as important as understanding any of the physical parts of um, caring for, for families, so understanding, you know, what's going on. So I just wanted to share some of the, the key points that I found the most interesting you know, and helpful for me over the last couple of years on my learning journey, working with these amazing um, women. So most of the research around trauma in the past has been done around um, war and post-traumatic stress Order and I think you know lots of us were familiar with hearing about that. Over the last couple of decades, you know, you've been getting this increased understanding that it actually has been most of the trauma that people experience starts a lot earlier than that, and for many people in childhood. And this complex trauma or intergenerational trauma that people talk about is related to repeated traumatic experiences where separation is really difficult. Um, and this, the World Health Organization has finally form, formally recognised um, the cluster of distress symptoms here, which is a little bit clinical, but just, you know, these are probably things that I think all of us um, can relate to. So having trouble, essentially complex trauma is a relational trauma, so having those interpersonal disturbances and trouble. The negative self-concept, which really talks to all that, labelling that Carly was just talking about now and having problems with regulating emotions in addition to those other um, feelings of a sense of threat, avoidance and re-experiencing the trauma that um, that we know about from, from traumatic stress. Dana, thanks for doing these. Thanks. So when we think about the... Um, about complex trauma, we it really is around two conflicting survival mechanisms. So there's the defence or fear mechanism, and all of us we have these fright, flight, and freeze responses that are absolutely essential for our survival. And also, as children, we're really dependent on our caregivers for a long time. But really, attaching and having a good relationship with our caregiver is also important. But when the fear responses are activated, it's during early childhood that can cause an internal conflict and this can cause internal confusion and we think that this is one of the really key things that causing those ongoing problems um, you know, that we're experiencing in trauma. Thanks. Next, Dana. So these, we know now there's so much research coming out around um, the physical impact of trauma and you'll be able to download this off the website if you like, but it just, it's just every single part of the body. It's not just a, um, a mental, psychological issue. It really is affecting every part of the body, and you can feel that when you're feeling those triggering, but why those um, exercises that Carly and Judy went through really earlier, why they're really important to help to regulate it. And it's all um, this there, just talking about the importance of um, exercise and, and physical strategies as well. Thanks, Dana. So, from our Aboriginal perspective, you know, these impacts on our physical, social, emotional well being, they, they really impact every single component of our social, emotional well being. This is essentially relational trauma, it's impacting on our connections that we know is really important. And here we've just overlaid training from the Blue Knot Foundation, which I'm sure many of you have been involved in, and the impacts that they outline in their training onto our social emotional wellbeing model. And you can see that it impacts on our connection to our spirit, 
to our body, to our mind, to our family and our community. And we still don't have enough Aboriginal resources, but we're sure that it is going to be for other connections. Thanks, Dana. So now that we're in this COVID-19 world, I think we can say, you all safely know what an epidemiologist is. So looking at the, um, the sort of epidemiology of all means. So when we we have all those impacts at an individual level, but all of this impacts on us collectively as a community as well. And we're seeing that really, really clear in the research now. So in that beautiful video that the Healing Foundation put together, um, we know that the prior to colonisation we didn't have this trauma, that historical violence led to the violence that more children are exposed to today. The living conditions that people are living in tend to make things worse rather than better. And all of this we know from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study lead to increased health risks and problems. And they also mean that the things, health promotion strategies don't work well. And a really important time for um, you know, counteracting this is the transition to becoming a parent, that's when we really get the intergenerational. So that can be a time when it can be increasingly difficult and a really, really tough time for parents. It's also a really important time of healing and we suspect the parents a lot at that time. So it's obviously also a really critical time for the parents. So we're seeing at the moment it was a sort of compounding intergenerational effect and that is you know, something that we all need to work to together now and I think, um, you know, we can. So, thank you, Dana. Great. Thank you so much, Kath. Um, we're now going to move on to some other questions of the panel. Um, and the first one I'd really like to ask everyone is around cultural competence. So <laughs> I know it's important. Um, it's a word that gets thrown around, um, sometimes without any depth of explanation. So I want to reframe the question. Um, for professionals. What is the thinking, the knowledge, the ways of being they need to bring to walk alongside families experience in inter intergenerational trauma? Judy, I wonder if I can hand back to you first to consider that. Oh, I love how you reframed it. It's great. Um, one of the first things that we have to do is get rid of our ego. Unfortunately, uh, universities kind of say that they are graduating culturally competent workers, but we cannot claim to be culturally competent unless we are able to sit quietly, be with, be present with others so that they feel safe when we're working with them, when we're with them. Uh, they'll come to us because they feel safe. And um, it, it's really important. To, I'm going to say this again. Uh, I've just come back from the territory where I saw somebody who behaved in a very abusively uh, incompetent way in the way she spoke to a young Aboriginal man who really wanted to do something about something that was important and she started to lecture him publicly. Um, she showed a level of incompetence. So did he feel safe? in the room where we were when this happened in the workshop? No, he didn't. Um, did he feel uh, that he was being respected? No, he didn't. Um, yes, he was physically safe, but emotionally and spiritually and, 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 um, and, and socially he wasn't because he was um, being lectured publicly. Um, I guess part of what we need to be thinking about is, um, is how we engage with people. So. I talk about not just cultural safety and cultural, um, the Tater Institute talks about uh, cultural security, feeling secure in myself as an Aboriginal woman and that young man feeling secure in himself as a young man who wanted to go and help other young men. He didn't need to have a lecture. But I also want workers to start to think about how they feel they are. So I'm going to talk about being culturally fit. That means that we have to continually look at ourselves in the way we're engage, engaging. And I want to bring it back to when my dad used to take his, his kids down surfing and he would teach us 
safe practice. He would show us where the uh, surf lifesavers were and the flags. And he would tell us that when we went to Main Beach, where I grew up, I grew up in Southport, that we should always uh, go into the surf between the flags because there would be somebody there looking at our surf. So as kids, we got in and we learned to surf and we thought it was great fun. Um, and I felt safe because I always knew somebody was there just making sure that I knew what I was doing. But one day, I'd like to suggest that I got a little bit um, smart and I looked at and I saw, and I'm, I'm using a, a model here, um, I saw somebody out on the surfboard and I thought, I'd love to have a go at that. So I wander off and I get a surfboard and I paddle out over the, the other side of the breakers. And then because I've seen other people do it, I stand up on the surfboard and I really didn't know a lot about what I was doing, but I come to the breakers and the breakers took me up and I went right down under the water and smashed my nose into the sand. And when I came up, I thought to myself, I am never doing that again. Now, I see a lot of people come into our communities who have a dive, they fall off the surfboard, they hit their nose in the sand and they come up. And they say, oh, I'm never going to go and work with that mob again. Or they start to denigrate the people they're working with. So being culturally fit, whether we're Aboriginal people or non-Aboriginal people, um, allows us to go into a really heavy situation when we're working. Um, we may not be able to stand up on the surfboard straight away, but we're watching and we're listening and we're being respectful and we're trying to ensure that the people that we're with feel safe with us. And um, we find out by listening uh, that things are um, maybe not good in that community or a little bit better, but we're capable of working with the community in a way where we're not um, denigrating them, putting labels on them. Um, so I guess then, and there's another terminology here I'm going to uh, introduce, is to become proficient of uh, being in situations where, and I've seen, I've seen a lot of people do this, doctors, police, um, social workers, uh, workers who want to go and, and save the world. Um, they suddenly start to feel um, incompetent because their services are not welcomed or not meeting the needs and then they become unsafe and they're certainly not competent in the way they're responding to the community's needs. So I'm just going to go over that. Cultural competency is uh, generally what universities say they graduate students with. We need to work very, very hard to become culturally safe, creating environments where people feel safe, um, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, where there's no assault or challenge on them and who they are and what they need. And the Toda Institute talks about cultural security, a dimension of human security that has been neglected in how we work with each other. And I'm now saying, you know what, I also need to be culturally fit because I'm working in situations that is beyond anything I've seen in my 77 years. Things have changed under the impacts of generational trauma and the drugs that are hitting our community. So I need to be fit and be willing to go back in and keep on having a go and not judge other people. That's how I describe competency, safety, security and being fit in the work I do. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, Carly, um, what would you say are the things that professionals need to be bringing to this work? What's your views about that? Yeah, look, very similar to what Mum's saying, and I certainly prefer the term cultural fitness to make sense. Because what it does is it requires a really strong personal and professional development focus. There's a lot of the training, and I know this happened to me at uni, um, around profession, it's around professional development, and it doesn't really focus on that personal development. And essentially, if you don't do the work on yourself, we don't know, and Mum said, who we are and if we don't unpack and reflect on our own privilege, our own biases and, you know, perhaps even our own trauma, that speaks onto the people that we work, along, work alongside. And and how we do that is through regular deep listening and reflective practice. Um, and if we don't do that, really it's all academic and experiences like uh, the labels activities that I talked about earlier, Mum talks about, 
continue to happen. can also say and reiterate what Mum was saying. It's also the responsibility of organisations to ensure that their staff are culturally for they send them out to work alongside our people. Not, it's not fair on the, the worker that's being sent out there, but it's certainly not fair on the community and the people there attempting to work alongside. So, Carly, um, as I think I heard you say, it was really around that importance of making some level of personal commitment. It's about thinking about spending the time on your own development as well as learning from training. Both Absolutely. of those things are essential. Yeah. Essential, yeah. yeah. Essential. That, yeah. Essential. yeah. Right. Thank you, Carly. Um, and, and, Kath, I can now hand over to you now to talk a little bit about holding space in response to this question. Yeah, thanks, Dani. I'm just going to um, draw on the collective wisdom here of a really fantastic workshop that we had in our spring um, that Judy and Carly were a part of as well um, in 2000 and, like 2018, where we we really we spent a whole day with a whole bunch of predominantly regional professionals and others to talk about you know what needs to happen if people are going to be holding these really sensitive discussions. What are the really critical elements um, to be that need to be in place before anybody starts talking about intergenerational trying to work families around um, intergenerational trauma and these are the main points that came out of that workshop so the first one was the real importance of um, emotional safety as well as cultural safety so really being cognizant of all those um, triggers and the, the, the issues talking about trauma brings up and actively managing that and we, we did a lot of fun stuff during the workshops to help manage it and really practical strategies too just like um, you know using play-doh and uh, clay and dance and things like that. People talked about how having relationships and trust were absolutely central before having any of the discussions and um, listening to people and being able to hold space having relations and relationships and trust to underpin all that was really critical. There was a lot about learning those cultural methods of, you know, not not just sort of being in people's faces about things and talking really directly, but really drawing on that cultural wisdom and using those methods like yarning and, um, you know, letting the conversation, feeling, being with the conversation and, and letting things emerge, listening really deeply with the dairy that, um, you know, Judy and we have really talked about the importance of being really skilled as well and, and holding the space and I think, um, you know, being able to do that really well is a really, really skilled job. People really emphasise the importance of respect and caring and compassion and I know we bandy those words around but in the context of trauma those are really, really important. We can't emphasise them enough. It does, often when you ask people what was important about the discussion that they said they felt careful and that the people were nice. Sometimes I think as a health professionals we you know, like Judy said, we can feel incompetent. But just being respectful and caring and compassionate does a lot more than it is actually doing a lot. And just to really recognise how important that is. And the final thing was just really trying to be positive. Um, not Pollyanna ish about it. But the importance of really, you know, drawing on people's strengths and hearts and dreams. Thanks, Dana. Thank you so much, Kaz. Um, I just wanted to go back uh, to to Judy um, and uh, have a, a follow up question for you. You know, it might be, you know, some people might say that, um, you know, people should just get over this. You know, we're talking about this trauma. Just get over it. Um, I was interested in your response to that. I guess um, I'd like to um, respond to that by an experience I had in uh, the Northern Territory in Catherine just recently. We were a mixed group and there were some GPs in the group and we were doing uh, genograms all our history notes. They had the choice and two of the um, senior Medical people were really affected by their genograms. 
One of them uh, started to see the pattern that had been part of her family's history in her genogram and she was really quite emotionally distressed because she realised and, and said it publicly that she had lived most of her life choosing to live away from other people and choosing to live out and work out in remote communities where she didn't have to engage with people because of the four generations of trauma that was in her own family that she'd never recognised before. So at one level, this woman who came from overseas, from one of the British colonies, um, um, had a lot of privilege and she'd managed to get her degree and then become a doctor, but she, thought she was also carrying a lot of pain. Um, and so therefore she had isolated herself. The other doctor, on the other hand, was male, and he realised, she said, I realised that I sit in my surgery and an Aboriginal man will come in and he will have a drinking problem. And I will say to him, if you keep drinking, uh, you, you're going to um, damage yourself physically even more than you are now. And he then looked at us all and said, and every night I go home and I drink a bottle or two of wine. I, I can't focus or cope with the things that I know that are in my life. He, again, had a level of privilege because he'd had the opportunity to go to university and get a degree. Um, getting over it means accepting all the things that have happened in our life. And that includes the levels of trauma that we all live with. Um, so it's not just an Aboriginal uh, story of getting over it, it's a story in Australia generally of getting over um, the, the white privilege that holds people into a judgmental or a, a non-aware state um, that they might have brought from the country that they came from or it might have come on the prison hulk. Getting over it means that we, in this country now, with uh, the, uh, the coronavirus, um, some of us are happy to be in the uh, privilege of a house we live in or we've got a garden and we, we can isolate ourselves and be safe and other people just don't have that. They may be homeless. Uh, they may have been a Vietnam vet or a returned veteran who, from Afghanistan who is homeless at this moment and that's happening a lot. Uh, they may be a school teacher who's not coping too well. It's not just about Aboriginal people getting over it. Um, it's about all of us, all of us starting to look at and address seriously with intent, address the trauma uh, that is generational and part of the Australian cycle, the new way that we live together. So um, I just want to reiterate that in the two cases that I wanted to name, um, it was two very privileged people who actually were GPs um, who suddenly realised that uh, they hadn't got over early childhood trauma, but they were coping with it, one by drinking and the other by living in isolation out in the community. So mm. thank you, Diana. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, now we're going to move on to the next question, but I just wanted to make a quick point before we do that. Um, we really appreciate people um, having a chat. Um, uh, but we were just wanting to make sure that if you do have a chat conversation, please ensure that it, maintains, it keeps respectful. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so I'd like to move on to our next question. Um, now, this is really about what you are seeing, all of you. You know, what are you seeing in your work that is making a positive difference for families, children and young people? And I mean this in individual practice or at an organisational level. What should we do more of? So that was a really long question, but I wonder if I can start with Carly first to talk a little bit about what you think is needed, um, or what have you seen that's positive, and what should we do more of? Thanks, Carly. Diana, the work that I'm seeing that is really make a profound difference, um, and I know Mum will talk when when she has her turn, making a real difference in individual and as I said, and, um, individual practitioners and organisations, where there is a focus of moving beyond being trauma-informed and into being trauma-integrated. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when individual workers integrate that trauma knowledge into their own lives. As I was saying before, and I know Mum was saying too, doing your own healing work, 
relevant and that would help people that we walk alongside integrate that knowledge into their own life. Next importantly, who organisations integrate knowledge uh, throughout their policies and procedures and um, the work they do with other relevant organisations in a significant way. I really think that only when we see that happen that true authentic transformation that we talk about is going to happen. I'm also seeing programs that are really positive and some of the things they have in common um, is they have strong creative art, nature-based cultural focus, um, which importantly involves the whole family and then also the whole community. They're designed and led by a mob um, and they're making a positive difference to programs all over Australia that have similarity. So that's what I say. Essentially, any activity that are repetitive, rhythmic, culturally relevant, of course, relational, um, talking about and respectful and rewarding, that all, they all contribute to healing and also, most importantly, regulate our so the question you ask, what should we do more of? Well, I'm thinking more of those things. More truth-telling, more healing, more storytelling, more dance, more art, more song, more ceremony, and more connection to nature. Thanks so much, Carly. And I think there was some key points that I just wanted to, to highlight out of, of what you said. Um, it's because the first thing I really heard was, I think it was a very powerful statement, so I want to reiterate this for our listeners, is, is about the difference between just having one, one, you know, to get to trauma-informed to then to trauma-integrated. I think that was a really powerful statement. Um, some other points that I felt were, were really important that I heard that you just said is, is, is how we can do things where our people are leading those things. And we're doing it in ways where um, we have not only healing, music, rhythm, all sorts of things that um, can connect um, with our community and the things that matter to us seem to be um, the most powerful things. Did I, did I um, h highlight those key things in the right way, Carly? Yeah, in summary. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dana. Great, thank you. Um, I wonder now if I can go back to Judy. Um, you know, what are you seeing in your work that's been making a positive difference for families, children, and young people um, in individual practice or at an organisational level? Well, I want to talk about those individual um, uh, responses uh, to pain and the organisation's capacity to change. So I'm going to talk about children in school, children who for many reasons, have been expelled or suspended from other schools. So they come to a special school for children who are really hurt. Um, they're called bad kids. The community, uh, the non-Aboriginal community, label them as bad kids. And then the children settle in because the, the, the school principal believes that we just love children. We see the, the, the good in them and we just love them and we give them opportunities to, to experience themselves in that way as well. And then at the end of the week, the school principal would make a point to start calling parents. And the parent, um, in many cases, the response oh, this is um, uh, this is so-and-so school, so-and-so principal, I'm just calling you. And before that she could say any more, the parents would say, well, what has the little C done now? And then the principal would say, no, no, no. I'm really to tell you that little Billy has just had the most wonderful day or week and he's done this and this and then there's a silence on the end, other end of the phone and then you hear crying and then you hear a parent say, that is the first time anybody has ever said anything good to me about a child. Can I come up and see you one day? And then the parent starts to drop into the school. So what I'm talking about here is a, a person who decides to start to feed good news back to parents who are living in bad news, when children are in crisis, and the family's in crisis. And then there's a change, and the parents started to drop into the school, uh, offered to say, do some cooking and things like that. There are two things I want to finish with. All children need to be seen, to be heard, we know that they are loved and that they are understood, all children. And all people, whether they're parents, practitioners, uh, they're school teachers, doctors, lawyers, all of that kind of 
They need to hear, to listen. And in their hearing and listening, to start to think, and they will start to understand what we're working with and the needs of our community. Uh, there's some beautiful stuff happening in our community. Um, I've spent uh, four weeks every six months in Oxford Springs prison with the women. And what I saw is uh, women who cared for each other. I spent time out of the school and I just sent a, a thing off today to the United States so for books. And I reported the story in uh, a Western New South Wales town. It was in the middle of winter, it was freezing. And I turned up at the school and the little fella came to school with no shoes on, a flimsy little t-shirt, a pair of shorts, and that's all he had. And I knew the family and I knew how hard it was for them. But I thought, my goodness, this child, they breathed them tough out here. It was freezing, there was ice on my car window. The next day, there were children from that school who had pretty well as little as much as he had turned up at that school for him. So I guess what I'm wanting to talk about here in the, the beauty of who we are is um, that sometimes in the toughest times we can actually bring good things to us. Like the teacher who just made a phone call to tell a mother who's struggling that her little fellow's doing okay. And the children who decided to bring warm clothing for a little fella whose family couldn't afford warm clothing for him in the winter. Ah, there's a lot of things out there. We should just look at them and see them and name them and know them. Great. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, I'd like to go back now to, to Kath. Um, if you could talk us through what you're seeing that's really positive um, for individuals or organisations. Okay, thanks, Dana. Well, I'm predominantly working in um, maternity care services, and there is, you know, quite a lot happening there. I think um, going back to what Carly said about trauma integrated care, I think that's really, really important. It's something that we we need to learn a lot about. I think the first thing is actually, you know, rec services recognising the trauma that has been caused historically in those services and. Um, the healing, you know, really start telling. But there is a lot of really good work going on around the birthing in our community models of care, and there's some fantastic work being done in WA with um, Rhonda Murray with the Birthing in Country there, and Yvette Rowe and, and the team up in Queensland, setting up really fantastic models of care, you know, in partnership with communities, and also here in Victoria. Um, Teams of midwives that are community led, that are drawing back on a lot of that traditional wisdom and knowledge um, about how better to support parents. And the other thing that I think has been really exciting and positive has been um, starting to get more involvement with dads, and that is absolutely critical. For something that's been missing for a long time and really, really essential. But just with that, is really something that's starting. I've just put up this slide here. We 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 did in a project that we're working on called Healing the Past by Nurturing the Future with Carly and Judy. We looked at parents' views and experience of maternity care service were during pregnancy, birth, and uh, the first couple of weeks after birth. And the interviews with 351 parents. We then talked about with Aboriginal parents here in Australia as well, and and a lot of the same thing reinforced. Parents really just talked about the importance of time for a fresh start, the changing roles that are going through. I think everybody identifies with a lot of these. The importance of being connected to each other, how important it was to have that care, and the importance of having choice and empowerment and creating safety. And there was this analogy of parents wanting to reweave a future from complex trauma, so pulling together those broken strands of the past to weave something together that's stronger for themselves and their family and, and the way that we can do that. And, and you know, some of the models that I've seen here in Australia around birthing on country and involving that trauma and care, really looking you know, promising and lots of innovation in the community. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, Kath. And I wondered if I could sort of um, go back to something that you said earlier, which was really around the importance of, of I think, what you mentioned with dads being involved. Mm. Um, yeah, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about, um, if you can, about um, the ways that's happening. Well, there's not enough of it, obviously, and I think, you know, in maternity care and in parenting, men have been excluded and that has been particularly a part of colonisation as well, of Aboriginal dads in particular. You know, we all know how bad that has been and the way that Aboriginal men are portrayed and that is, you know, awful. And, you know, we've seen... This is such an important time for people who have experienced childhood trauma to to recover from that and we do see that women recover better than men and I think part of that we've seen that in the longitudinal studies of um, people that have been through youth in detention and nearly all severely traumatised um, that women seem to actually recover a lot better during this parenting transition and men I think a part of that is you know, cause, cause of all the problems um, that's been going on. So there are some guys that are starting to lead this. Obviously, this is a men's led thing, but also just about you know, trying to make us serve much more um, inclusive of mm. that. Well, does that answer the question, or did you want to? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Kaz. Um, Judy, I just wondered if I could uh, come back to you uh, uh, again. I just wanted to check in with you to see if there's any specific programs or um, areas that you wanted to touch on that you think are particularly positive. I'm really excited about the work we're doing with children now. Um, mm -hmm. I've said for a long time that our children are our future and uh, it's taken us nearly eight, nine years to, to break into... Uh, breaking down the barriers that the children have been labelled as bad kids. You can see, you know, that yeah, people just assume. And then that kind of education is sitting up and saying, we want to know more about this. And we, I've got six months to work in a community. And if this works, then they're going to put it across New South Wales schools. Um, I'm excited about that because it's taken us a long time to, um, to stop the labelling of children as just bad children. Um, and, and understand that, you know, that's why I said before, you know, uh, when we see a child, we hear a child, and a child knows that it's loved, then we know that we're succeeding. They know that they're understood. Um, everywhere I've been, in every place, in every part of Australia, uh, when I've worked on suicide, I see the child who was not hurt. Uh, when I'm sitting uh, with somebody in a prison, I'm hearing the story, the child has not been heard. So the kinds of programs we're doing now that are focusing on children's needs um, and building that capacity for children to feel good about themselves, um, that's important. Uh, the number of people who are now uh, getting on through year 11, 10, 12 and going into university is, is, is amazing. And um, those young people are going back to their communities, and I can think of two at this stage who qualified as doctors to work in their own communities. They're the kinds of things that excite me. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them at a time because I know that we've had trouble with the sound tonight. Uh, but, yeah, there's some really good things happening out there. But I just want to say this to finish what I want to say tonight. Um, sometimes you don't get to the good stuff. And so you've sat in the hard things. The hard stories, the painful stories, take us to the healing. You just can't jump across it. I'll leave it at that. And J Judy, I wondered if I could follow up with that because I think that's a pretty powerful thing that you just said that I'm sure people are interested in. You were talking about that, that sitting with the hard stuff. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Because I'm sure they'll be, they'll be interested. I've got two terminologies, um, symptom is history. So I go into a community and I'm starting to see things that don't look so good and as I unpack it, I'm sitting in a community um, in, and I'm thinking of a particular community that asked me to run a workshop and uh, 
we were three hours into the workshop and one of the senior people stood up and said, we've got to talk about child uh, sexual assault here in this community. And that sounds like a negative, but it wasn't. It was a powerful statement. And we spent the rest of the three days unpacking that and that community has moved on tremendously from that now. So what seems like a negative, finding the stories, feeling the feelings that are part of those stories, um, starting to feel that we can do something for ourselves, understanding that, um, there's a, for those of you who like to read, there's an absolutely amazing thesis out by a fellow called Gavin Morris. And it's about a truth telling in a community in the Northern Territory. And then the decision to set up what he's calling an ancient university, a place where people can come and learn um, better ways of living together. But the truth of is powerful. It's painful, it's shameful, and it's powerful because people are owning the generational impact of trauma that are now in their lives today. That's what I think is exciting, when we're owning our own stories and doing something about it. Thanks so much, uh, Judy. Um, we're, we're coming very soon to a close, uh, so I wanted to make sure that I do give all of our panellists the opportunity to do a final final um, set of key messages that you'd like to give to people. So I'd like to first hand over to Carly. Um, in, in summarising, in reflecting on what we've talked about tonight, Carly, um, what are some of the key messages you'd like to leave with, with um, all of our uh, participants tonight? Donna, probably a number of things. Um, we go through them. What I was saying before about organisations and individuals needing to provide and start to consider this concept of trauma integrated services, so moving beyond the trauma reform is a really important one. Um, I, or, or Mum and I are certainly talking about knowledge. Doing that work on yourself, it really does make a huge difference. Um, another point is be courageous and break truth telling. It is, you know, it, it's uncomfortable, but if we can be there and we can hear what we need to hear, um, it's certainly going to help us and whoever is telling that story move forward. Relationships, they're critical. Learn how to nurture them. Um, what else comes like stories to save lives? Learn to listen deeply. You know, you, you hear from when mum talks stories and things that helps us empathize authentically, makes it real. Um, two other points, uh, culture is strong and importantly it regulates our nervous system which is incredibly important. And the last thing I'll say is nature yields. So any activity that involves being outside, discovering and learning about the amazing world we live in mm. um, is always a good thing. Thanks, a lot. Thanks so much, Carla. And I just wanted to reflect on it. Just for, there was a little, still a little bit of cutting out, so I just want to make sure the messages are clear that people are hearing. So I think I really heard that kind of that trauma informed um, to trauma integrated. Um, you also talked about the importance of actually of nature and getting out there, um, being in our beautiful world. Um, so important, even now, <laughs> even more important yeah. now. Um, um, you talked a bit about that that that. Um, reflecting on relationships and the importance of how we build those. Um, and you also talked, and I'll, and I'll come to Judy to talk a bit more about this, you talked about discomfort and feeling uncomfortable as a, as a key thing to be able to, to work with. So I just, I will jump to Judy for a second. That, that, that issue about discomfort, feeling uncomfortable. Can you talk a little bit more about feeling discomfort and feeling uncomfortable and being able to sort of embrace that? There's two levels or layers of that. First of all, it's the discomfort I feel in myself and maybe sometimes also feeling a little bit inadequate when I realise the extent of the pain, the stress and how do I respond to it. Um, the other discomfort is when I'm with a child or a mother or a grandmother or a dad, granddad, um, and, and I'm aware of the pain they're carrying, the stories they hold. Uh, I was standing in front of a man not so long ago who had um, not done the rest in his life and he desperately wanted me to understand him and he started to talk about the pain he was carrying and suddenly he pulled his shirt back 
and he put his hand on the big scar that was on his chest where he'd been stabbed and he wanted me to feel his pain and see his pain too. So the discomfort is that we can't just get over uh, this over um, the discomfort of having to stay home. We have to do that. So we can't just get over the generations that came down after the massacres, after the child removal, after the missions, after the things that have happened. And it just doesn't all just go away. We're carrying this pain. So I'm going to go back to the things that I, I put up with my hand over and over again. This hand uh, says that I have to work to create safe places for people. And if it's me, and it's me being able to sit on the floor with somebody and be safe when they want to talk, that's good. And then I help them find those stories. And those stories can be painful and shameful, uh, not just to hear, but for them tell. Um, but it's also painful and shameful in the way that Australia has let things happen. And know that under those stories are, are deep feelings. And those feelings can be uh, feelings of all those words that are just through shame, pain, anger, distress, whatever, but they're there. And then we come back to managing the feelings, feeling okay, knowing that we'll be okay in that. Because under all of this are layers of loss and grief. And we know that there's a way through that, particularly in Aboriginal ceremonial processes. Loss and grief, sounds music, making sense of stories until we can claim and reclaim our cultural and spiritual identity. I've seen that right. as adults, but I've also seen it with children who will draw and paint. And when they tell you the story, you have to stop because they're willing to tell you the sad and bad story uh, before they can come to the good story of who they are in their artwork. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Judy. And Cass, um, just handing over to you now, was there a final um, key message you'd like uh, participants to reflect on? Um, I guess as a sort of researcher in this area, I just really would like to emphasise um, how much knowledge, sophisticated knowledge, particularly around intergenerational trauma there is in communities. Um, it's just my... But I feel like when I often read the Western research around this area, it feels, yeah, it's very detailed, but in some ways a little bit primitive. And then when I, to Judy and to others that have been working in this area for a long time, and, um, you know, if I'm lucky enough to talk to elders, that kind of have knowledge as well. The understanding just seems really sophisticated, and I think this is something that, you know, really encourage people in our community to really own. And I think... You know, not only is this going to help us and our kids, but I really do think this is something that, you know, is not going to be leading to something really sophisticated and exciting, I think. Thanks so much, Kath. So I think what I'm hearing is that um, what we can learn from Aboriginal communities can benefit other communities too because of that sophistication and that tradition and that ceremony, etc. Yeah, I think we don't. Um, yeah, we, do, we need to realise how good it is. Just... Absolutely. Thanks so much, Kath. Well, um, we're nearly at the end wow. now, and I just wanted to um, thank all of the panellists. I knew that I would be so delighted, and it would be a special opportunity for me as well to listen to all of you. So on behalf of all of us, I wanted to thank you so much um, for everything you've said and you've shared tonight. Thank you. There's a few final things that as facilitated I have to do before we close off tonight. Um, so basically just to let you know that uh, there are resources that are available for you. Um, and at the light blue icon um, on the top right of the screen, um, it'd also be um, really great if you could um, complete the survey, um, an exit survey and, and provide feedback. Um, that's at the yellow, um, yellow icon on the top right. Um, just wanted to let you know that the next webinar in our series will be on the 29th of June and it is engaging children and parents affected by child and sexual abuse 
The next M um, HPN webinar is Monday the 18th of May. Tips and strategies in using technology for mental health uh, consultations. And, and just finally, just a few things around um, the partnership um, you know, regarding uh, MHPN and Emerging Minds. This was a co-produced webinar between MHPN and Emerging Minds for Emerging Minds, the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health Project. This project is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child Youth Mental Health Program. Um, and MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing management of practitioner networks where clinicians from different, different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips, resources, build local referral pathways and engage in CPD activities. Um, due to the current environment, most MHPN networks have been postponed. However, some are organising online meetings. So feel comfortable to contact MHPN to learn more about joining your local practitioner network. So you can also integrate, um, indicate your interest in this in the exit survey as well. So in final, I'd like to say, um, and before I close, thanks again to the panellists. Thank you to all the participants and thank you for your patience with our, some of our technical difficulties. And I'd also like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone for your participation this evening and keep safe um, during these times.